Thank you, Peter. Um, I knew I'd finally uh, reach the day where I'd be grateful for having a doctorate and the underpricing of IPOs because I don't have to decide whether I'm a naturalist or a consequentialist or a, a Montague or a Capulet, um, so I'm not even going to tell you. Um, I, in fact, have a very easy job coming after the free speech giants who have spoken before me uh, and speaking before Ben, who has to, poor thing, talk about metadata laws. I hope he's been speaking to our Attorney General and getting some advice on that. Um, look, I'd like to thank Greg, as everyone else has, for, for being part of this important event. And I really do pay tribute to the CIS. You know, I regard the people at the CIS as <coughs> providing the ballast and the fortitude and the strength that, that holds up the intellectual architecture around freedom in this country. They're the human equivalents, I think, of those magnificent flying buttresses on the Notre Dame. Without them, we'd be nowhere. Um, I'd like to pay special tribute, though, Greg, to whoever came up with this fantastic graphic, because I've been sitting here for a couple of hours, and I'm pretty sure the guy on the right is Adam Bant telling Tony Abbott to shut up. <laughs> and sadly, Tony Abbott has shut up, so I think that says everything about 18C. Maybe the years need a bit of work, but I'm pretty sure that's Abbott. <laughs> Um, look, sometimes I do despair that we have to come together at such regular, on such regular occasions to defend free speech. But then I remind myself why we do it. And if we think about it, liberty is unfinished business. It was unfinished in 1688 when Abraham Lincoln delivered that famous speech, just 266 words, when he recalled the birth of a nation that had been conceived in liberty. And he honoured the dead, those who, he said, gave the last full measure of devotion for fighting for freedom. Lincoln called on us, the living, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work of liberty. He implored us to take increased devotion to this cause of liberty. And in 2015, liberty is still unfinished business. There's no point talking about the importance of liberty around free speech without first reminding ourselves of, the, of, of why it matters, of going back to first principles, because sometimes those first principles get lost amidst new fads and orthodoxies. Free speech is both the oil and the fuel that keeps the ideals of the Enlightenment working. It's vital to that central piece of machinery that mark a place of ideas where we test ideas, where we work out which ones work and which ones don't, and it enables us to progress as a society rather than stagnate. So what is the role of the media in this unfinished work of liberty? Well, surely it's to question, to challenge, to explore, to be intellectually honest and intellectually curious. And when we, we in the media stop doing these things, I think we stop servicing that machinery that powers the marketplace of ideas. Now, if you've turned on the TV or the radio or read a newspaper recently, you'll see that the media can get very worked up indeed about, um, about free speech. For example, it, uh, on metadata laws, it's done nothing else but cry about how it's in, in, infringing on free speech. But I think there are self-imposed subtle restraints that are far more dangerous to our democracy than any kind of new metadata law. Instead of fueling the marketplace of ideas, the media too often fuels a marketplace of outrage where debates are stifled. Let me give you an example. When a terrorist took 18 people hostage at gunpoint at the Lynn Cafe in Sydney late last year, sections of the media were more interested in extolling the virtues of a hashtag campaign called I'll Ride With You and predicting Islamophobia among Australians than discussing the unfolding Islamic terrorism inside that Martin Place cafe. To their man, Haron Monas was just a disgruntled loner, a madman with killing on his mind who just happened to have a black and white flag, just happened to demand an Islamic State flag, and who just happened to pledge allegiance to the Islamic State. <coughs> we need more people in the media, though, to point out that when a killer slaughters people in the name of Islam, we should take him at his word. Monas is, as someone alluded to earlier, the newest form of terrorist. There is no Islamic State membership card, there's no initiation ceremony, there's not even a welcoming morning tea. But curiously, when Islamic terrorists struck at the offices of the satirical newspaper Charlie Edbo in January, immediately the media unanimously agreed, well, this is Islamic terrorism. Kill a customer in a cafe and it's the work of a disgruntled loner. Kill a journalist and it's Islamic terrorism. 
But that was just the warm up act, I think, for more hypocrisy in the media and the wider political class. Following the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attacks, people, as you know, flocked to join free speech marches right across the globe, declaring Je suis Charlie. Well, good on them, I think, for showing solidarity. I was in New York that day and I walked past a tiny shop on a street corner in Soho and uh, the, the owner of the shop had put up a rather grimy poster on his grimy window that said Je suis Charlie. And on a chilly New York day, it warmed my heart to see that. But that's all it did because we won't win this long and sinister battle over Western freedoms with unity walks or neat slogans or hashtag trends on Twitter. We need more people in the media to point out the humbug and the hypocrisy. The Turkish Prime Minister was among the leaders standing shoulder to shoulder at the front of that free speech march in Paris. But his marching for free speech didn't sit terribly comfortably with Turkey holding a now two year record ahead of both Iran and China for jailing the most journalists. German Chancellor Angela Merkel was on the streets of Paris too. But the German Chancellor is less keen about free speech at home when it comes to difficult debates about integration and immigration. Barely two, two weeks earlier, Merkel had appealed to Germans to stay away from protests by people who are concerned about the growing Islamification of Germany. Trying to stifle these protests, church leaders in Cologne turned off the lights of the local cathedral so the protesters couldn't be seen. And the same happened in Dresden, where the bosses of the Opera House turned off the lights. Well, turning off the lights kind of sums up Europe's cultural malaise. <laughs> Explaining why millions of Germans are rather concerned about Europe's mealy mouth commitment to Western values. And while Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott was not in Paris, he was quick to say after those terrorist attacks, we must never compromise our values in defending them. Fine statement. But how does that sit with his decision to drop reforms of Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act? And if I may just um, digress for a moment, um, we spoke earlier about the state of the Liberal Party and with due respect, Dean, um, let me tell you what the state of the Liberal Party is in Victoria. It's pretty grim when someone like John Roscombe, the head of the IPA, can't get pre-selected because he's regarded as too controversial uh, for having ideas about freedom. It says a lot about a, what should be a great political party. 18C, as, as you've heard, is a direct hit on free speech in Australia. 18C inhibits the marketplace of ideas. Instead, it fuels the marketplace of outrage where people are treated as victims and they're, they're encouraged to scream loud to shut down debate they find offensive. Many of the people who declare Je suis Charlie are not Charlie, not in the least. They have nothing in common with the French newspaper that delights in offending religion and politicians, uh, the wider political class, pop culture, just about anything else in its sights. Because if the free speech marches are Charlie, then they are surely also Michel Houellebecq, the French novelist who was hauled before a French court for inciting hatred. If they are Charlie, they are also Andrew Bolt and Mark Stein, men who have felt the full force of laws that strike at the heart of free speech. And yet there's been no mass outrage about free speech battles fought by Hulbeck or by Bolt or by Stein. If the free speech walkers are Charlie, they are also Ayan Hirsi Ali. And yet the Muslim born writer is regularly scorned by the left intelligentsia as too provocative when she speaks about defending enlightenment values. In April last year, eight days after announcing that it would award Hirsi Ali an honorary doctorate, Brandeis University cowered to critics and decided to pull that doctorate. Let me give you an example of what the media should do more often. And I get a chance to do something that I rarely do, and that is praise the ABC. When the host of ABC's Late Line, Emma Alberici, late last year interviewed the man in Australia behind his butcheria, she challenged Dahiri's, his name is Wasim Dahiri, she challenged Dahiri's repellent, retrograde and evasive agenda. Well, full marks to her, I thought. We don't often see that. Mm -hmm. Rather than ban his butcheria, as the Prime Minister has uh, said he's looking at, we need more of that. We need more grit and courage in confronting organisations like his butcheria. But for too long, too many people, especially in the media, have taken the intellectually lazy route. 
They've given these extremists a platform as if they're some kind of harmless form of freak show entertainment. But that's too easy and it's certainly not the deal with free speech. When Islamic, is, when Islamic extremists such as the men who make up his butcheria exploit our liberties to expose their own freedom-loathing notions, well, surely it's our role in the media to exploit them in the best way that we can in a liberal democracy. And that is using our freedoms by confronting them and their ideas, by critiquing them and exposing their agenda as medieval and immoral. <coughs> Remember that his butcheria has precisely the same aims as Islamic State, the establishment of a caliphate and the annihilation of democracy, aims that are as territorial as they are ideological. Except, of course, that Islamic State has worked out how to catch our attention rather better with beheadings and sexual slavery and mass killings. But sadly, there are too many people in the media whose commitment to free speech grinds to a halt at politically opportune times. But it's not a part-time value. If you don't get marks for credibility when you attack the words and opinions of Andrew Bolt, and yet you stay quiet when men like Dahiri speak. Likewise, you lose credibility when you join free speech marches but go missing in action, action, action when a federal court judge uses Section 18C to strike down an opinion because he doesn't like its tone. It's important to understand why we've moved away from traditional notions of free speech. Forty years ago, the left abandoned libertarian notions of human rights and embraced a new definition of human rights that elevates egalitarian rights. And George Brandis has, has, has covered this. He said that the shift began with the elevation of the right to, quote, equal concern and respect, a notion that's been, that was developed and championed by philosopher and legal scholar Ronald Dworkin. Equal concern and respect. Well, what on earth does that mean? It's easier interpreting the words of the Income Tax Assessment Act than it is ascribing meaning to those four words, equal concern and respect. But of course, the beauty of that phrase has not been lost on the left. It means whatever you want it to mean. And it's peculiarly suited to the paternalistic tendencies and cultural relativism of the left. Here is the beginning, or here was the beginning, of a recalibrated human rights movement based around victimhood. Feelings became the measurement of human rights. And let me repeat, the marketplace of ideas is slowly being sidelined by this marketplace of outrage, where human rights legislation and anti-discrimination bureaucracies buttress the new victimhood movement. Free speech has become the obstacle to the left's notion of human rights as egalitarian rights. Recall the familiar opera of Muslim oppression used to shut down debate about Islam. And I've written about this before. Let me give you an update. <coughs> Sadly, it, it hasn't changed. The first act starts with something, something simple. Perhaps it's, called, perhaps it's a book called Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie, or it's a silly Danish cartoon, or a film called Submission, or a cheeky episode from South Park that sends up the fact that Muhammad seems to be the only guy free from ridicule. <coughs> and then the libretto comes. Many Muslims will scream about having their feelings hurt. The drama builds in the second act where you see death threats and fatwas and effigies burned, flags burned, a few boycotts imposed. And then we hear that great aria of all accusations, Islamophobia. The third act is the most depressing. This is where the West capitulates, preferring the path of least resistance to launching a staunch defense of freedom of expression. Hence, the, US pres the then US president, George H.W. Bush, declared both Salman Rushdie's book and the fatwa against him as equally offensive. And how many newspapers published those Danish cartoons? Well, mine didn't. Charlie Hedbo did. In the hours after the Paris attacks in January, Newsweek featured this headline, news outlets face difficult choice over controversial Charlie Hedbo magazine covers. Really? Difficult? We don't seem to have learned very much at all. In the media and, the, and beyond, there is a norm of anticipatory surrender and self-censorship. Instead of self-censorship, we need more intellectual curiosity and honesty. The, and here I am again praising the ABC. The ABC's Chris Yulman recently staked a claim for Western values when, during an interview with the Prime Minister, he said, surely in a truly tolerant Western society, 
We would hope for a day when Islam is so integrated that it can be criticised in the same way that Christianity is. Well, we need more of that. We need more people such as UK commentator and best-selling author of Londonistan, Melanie Phillips. In Australia recently, Phillips said that unless we understand the wellspring, wellspring of this religious fanaticism, we cannot possibly hope to defend ourselves. And she lamented how Western leaders speak at one, saying invariably that Islam is not the problem. She said this is lazy thinking. To pretend that Islamic violence, largely perpetrated, remember, against Muslims, is not based on a legitimate interpretation of their religion. Encouraging an Islamic religious reformation, she said, first requires confronting the legitimate interpretations of Islam by groups such as Hizbut Tahrir and Islamic State. <coughs> Having honest debates about Islam is not Islamophobia. A few weeks ago, Swedish Foreign Minister Margot Wallström delivered a scathing assessment of the treatment of women in Saudi Arabia. You probably haven't heard of it. It's probably my Scandinavian background that leads me to Scandinavian newspapers. Women can't drive, remember. They can't marry without permission. They can't even have medical operations without getting permission from men. Child marriages are common. So is public segregation of the sexes. Restaurants and banks have separate en entrances for men and women in Saudi Arabia. Wallstrom also castigated the Saudi justice system for sentencing Rafe Badawi to 10 years in jail and 1,000 lashes for setting up a website that promotes secularism and free speech. Well, what happened? Well, we saw the, op the oppression opera returned for a repeat performance. The Arab world screamed about Islamophobia. Uh, the Saudi Arabia withdrew its ambassador to Sweden and so did the United Arab Emirates. But well, what happened outside the Arab world was even more disappointing but predictable. Wallstrom's defense of Western values was greeted with silence in the West. As Nick Cohen writes in this week's Spectator, there is no Wallstrom affair. Outside of Sweden, the Western media barely covered the story. A small Scandinavian country faces sanctions, accusations of Islamophobia and maybe worse to come, and everyone stays silent. The scandal, he said, is that there is no scandal. The Germans have a word for this that I've used often, Toschwick taktik, death by silence. The media must play a role, a critical role, in keeping alive the marketplace of ideas. Too often it chooses silence or it becomes an echo chamber for the marketplace of outrage. And why is the media's role so critical? So that those who defend Western freedoms are too many to stand out. The journalists and the cartoonists that Charlie Edbo remember were sitting ducks for the Islamic terrorists. As one academic said in January, they alone stood in defence uh, in favour of press freedom against the jihadist culture camp. A lot like Hirsi Ali, who we know has been forced to live with 24-hour protection in countries such as the Netherlands, the US and Australia. As she said a few years ago, when more of us defend Western values, there will be simply too many people to threaten and at that time I won't need protection. Thank you.